good to be back this week. And last Sunday, I preached at the North Point congregation where Dub McClish is, and they said to send their hellos uh, to everyone here. And some of them uh, certainly could not hear properly because I know I did not say something that they claimed that I said, and Karen thought I did also. I mean, she needs to listen better. Uh, because uh, the, uh, sh they thought that I said that Ecclesiastes 18 and verse 4 and verse 20. Now, everyone knows that Ecclesiastes doesn't have 12 chapters. Oh, only 12 chapters, it doesn't have 18. So I wouldn't say that, obviously. Karen's, <laughs> Karen's on it three times. <laughs> they didn't say anything until uh, Dub, after we were home, Dub had to say something about it. And I just said, you know, I put it something in for everyone, those people who love to find errors and you know, have to have something for them as well. Uh, that still uh, did not elicit anything likened to the time in which uh, we were in California. And there were three individuals, Dub included, sitting right back in that area <clears throat> in the, toward the back. And as I was speaking away, I saw the three of them about to fall out of the pew laughing. Had no idea of what I said until afterwards someone asked me if I did it intentionally or not. And I said, do what? And so they told me what I had said, that, uh, and I've had difficulty ever since, since trying not to say it, but had uh, the rich man asking Abraham if Lazarus could tip the dip of his finger in water and cool his tongue. Now, I know that I would never say anything like that, but... Uh, fun to get your tongue tied sometimes, but sometimes it gets rather embarrassing as well. But they did send a hello uh, and greetings to the congregation here. Uh, of course, appreciate them and that congregation a great deal. Appreciate Tim and his lesson this morning. Uh, it, it was an excellent lesson that we need to take heed to and mention some things, of course, that are very troubling in our society today even. But we need to look to Jesus as that one who is our example. He is a perfect, a sinless example. We are to allow Christ to be formed in us, Galatians 4 and verse 19. We are to allow him to live in us so that it's not I who live, but Christ lives in me, Galatians 2 and verse 20. Paul would write that he, we are to have the mind of Christ, Philippians 2 and verse 5. And John would tell us in 1 John 2 and verse 6, we are to walk even as he walked. And so he is our sinless example. He, and we've looked at several areas in which he is our example. But this afternoon, we want to look at the aspect that Jesus is our example in suffering. And when we look at the example of Jesus in suffering and we look at that aspect of suffering, it generally refers to his death. For example, in Luke 24 and verse 46, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. There the suffering obviously 
put in connection with his rising from the dead has reference to his death. In Hebrews 9 and verse 26, For then must he have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. His putting away sin by the sacrifice of himself is explaining that aspect of his suffering and his suffering one time. Thus, another obvious reference of suffering to his death. When we see in Hebrews 13 and verse 12, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Well, again, the suffering there of Jesus has reference to his sanctifying the people with his own blood. That's his death, that he died upon Calvary's tree that happened outside of the gate. In 1 Peter the third chapter in verse 18, Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Here he suffered for sins. What did he do? He died for our sins. And it's talking about as we see, the just for the unjust, he was the just one, we were unjust, thus the vicarious death of Jesus. But it refers to it as his suffering. He suffered for our sins. And then 1 Peter 4th chapter and verse 1. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind that he... For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. He suffered for us in the flesh. Again, it has reference to his death. But there are also times in which the idea of suffering of Jesus is connected with his, the time just before his death and the agony, the pain that he went through in connection with his death. For example, Matthew 16 and verse 21. Jesus says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. So he's giving a list of things and he says he has, first he must go to Jerusalem, the second thing is that he's going to suffer many things of these individuals. The third thing is that he will be killed. The fourth thing is that he will be raised again the third day. So the suffering here is not in connection with his death, but in those events that led up to his death and the, the things that he suffered at that point in time that would deal with the trials that he went through the beatings and the scourging and such like that he went through. All of those things having reference to his suffering in that regard. But he is our example in suffering. He suffered. Well, when we deal with suffering of Christians, we likewise are going to suffer. The scriptures very clearly set forth the idea. For example, Jesus begins teaching us that, that aspect in the Beatitudes. Matthew, the fifth chapter. As he concludes those Beatitudes, the last one that he sets forth, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And I mention here, in reading what Jesus says here in the Beatitudes, he sets forth not only the idea of persecution as, and suffering being in regards to physical suffering, physical persecution, but he also set, ties in the idea of ridicule, 
when men shall revile you. It, he ties in the aspect of uh, blaspheming you. Speak evil against you, or say all manner of evil against you falsely. And so, many times when we talk about suffering or persecution, we, in our minds, limit it to that area of physical persecution. We don't, particularly within our nation at this point in time, have to endure physical persecution. Some places within our world, Christians do. And even as uh, Brother Worley mentioned in the prayer, ISIS, they do kill individuals who claim to be Christians. I'm not saying that the ones that they're killing actually are Christians. They claim to be Christians. And they would just as soon kill us, who are actual Christians, according to the New Testament usage of the word. They would just as soon kill us as they would anyone else. We tend to limit our thinking, though, that that's persecution. Where Jesus expands the idea of more than just simply physical persecution that we might endure. We might not ever endure physical persecution where we are beat or we're put to death from a physical standpoint as a result of Christianity. But that doesn't mean that we don't suffer persecution. Because Jesus ties in reviling you persecuting you, say all manner of evil against you falsely. All of these things embrace the suffering that Christians endure, and thus the persecutions that we endure. When someone ridicules, speaks evil of, speaks down upon Christians, they're persecuted. That Christian is suffering persecution. But Jesus begins laying that foundation. This will take place. This is what's going to happen. And as Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, he states in chapter 1 and verse 29, For unto you it is given in behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. I think it's interesting how he begins this. It's given in... It is, unto you it is given in behalf of Christ. Here is what Paul is presenting, a gift from God to you. And he says not only to believe, but also to suffer. We don't think of suffering as something that is a gift of God. Something that God is giving unto us. He is allowing it to take place upon us for our good. That's the idea that he is presenting. That here is something that God has determined is for your good. Persecution and suffering. We don't consider it that way though in our thinking. In Philippians, or in First Peter, the third chapter, in verse seventeen, Peter. In fact, the entire First Peter letter is dealing with suffering that's going to come as a result of the Neronian persecution. And he says in chapter three and verse seventeen, "For it is better if, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well doing than for evil doing." And Peter is presenting to us the idea, you're going to suffer. That's going to be the lot of humanity. You're going to suffer. You can suffer for doing evil, or you can suffer for doing well. And Peter is saying, you need to be suffering not for evil, but for doing good. If you skip down to the next chapter, chapter 4, verse 15 and 16, he again shows this aspect. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, as a busybody in other men's matters. 
Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So don't suffer for these things, but if you are suffering for Christ, for being a Christian, then don't be ashamed, glorify God. Why? Because God is allowing something good to happen to you. Again, going back to what Paul says to the Philippian brethren. In 1 Peter, the second chapter, verses 19 through verse 21, Peter would say, For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even two here and two were he called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. The example that Paul or that Peter sets forth here is the example of Jesus, is in direct relationship to Christians enduring persecution and suffering. But again, he he sets forth here what glory is it if you suffer if you're buffeted for your faults. There's no glory in that. There's no honor in that. That's what's to be expected. That when you do evil, you suffer for that evil. And our nation needs to learn that principle again. We... You know, even in the judicial system and the going, sending someone to jail. Try and talk about it being the aspect of pers- uh, being buffeted, where that person is receiving a just recompense of his reward. He's being punished in some way. Oh no, we're doing this to rehabilitate him. We don't want to punish him because the idea of punishment, we just can't have that. That goes back, you know, Dr. Spock years ago who came out, don't punish your children. You might harm their psyche, so don't punish them. Well, don't punish criminals now. We need to rehabilitate them, and so we're going to send them over here so that they can be rehabilitated. But it's not punishment. Well, here, Peter is saying, if you do evil, you're going to be punished. You're going to be buffeted for your faults. But there's no glory in that. But if you're doing good and you receive persecution, you take it patiently, then that's acceptable with God. And then Christ is our example in that. And so Christians are going to suffer. But they're supposed to suffer for doing that which is right. But let's notice our attitude in that suffering. Because the very nature of persecution and suffering is to cause an individual to feel ashamed. Go back to that which we just read there in 1 Peter 2. If you're buffeted for faults, what glory is it? There's no glory in that. You're made to feel ashamed because of the evil that you've done. And you're receiving a punishment of the, because of that evil. Thus feel shame as a result of it. But, on the other hand, here's Christians who are suffering because they are doing good. What's their attitude? Well, look at 2 Timothy 1 and verse 12. And Paul says, for, this call, or for the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I am not ashamed. Well, wait a minute. You're suffering persecution. That suffering is to cause shame. 
Paul says, no, I'm not going to be shamed over that. I'm not going to be ashamed because I was doing good. I was doing what God wanted me to do. And even though I am now suffering as a result of it, I will not be ashamed of it. In 1 Peter 4, verse 15 and 16, again, Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, evildoer, as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man be a, a suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God on this behalf. So don't be ashamed. Instead, glorify God. Why are we going to glorify God? Because he has given unto us that opportunity to be persecuted for righteousness sake. And so our attitude in that is not only not to be ashamed, but to feel that aspect of joy or blessedness. Matthew 5 and verse 10 through 12 again that we read earlier. Blessed are you. And then he tells them, uses the idea of being blessed two times in this, these three verses. Then verse 12, he changes it, rejoice and be exceeding glad. So you're blessed and you rejoice. The idea of blessed, and I know many translate it as happy, because that's the aspect of feeling that one has, but it goes far beyond the idea of simply being happy. It deals with someone who is in a right relationship with God and thus receives the blessings of God. He is being blessed by God. He has all spiritual blessings. He has peace within his life. He has joy within his life. He has purpose in his life. And you look at all of these aspects of Christianity and what Christianity presents to us. And you say, this is the individual thus who is truly being successful in life. That's the idea of being blessed. And happy is just one aspect, a small aspect of the, the being blessed and the full meaning of that word. Yes, we rejoice. Uh, there's that aspect of happiness. But the rejoicing is not as happiness indicates because of outward circumstances. The rejoicing is because of inward joy. Even though the outward circumstances might not be good. 1 Peter 3 and verse 14 King James translates this word blessed as happy here, but if ye, but and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. And again, it's that word that's translated in Matthew 5 as blessed. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. You see the same thing in chapter 4 and verse 13. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit and of glory and of God resteth upon you, and on, his, on their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. And so they translate that word, even in the King James, that's translated elsewhere, blessed. They should have translated it blessed in these passages, but they translate it happy. But it's far more than just and outward circumstances because the outward circumstances of someone who's being persecuted is not good. It's not going to cause the outward circumstances that that individual finds himself in is not going to cause him to be laughing and ha being happy. But he can still have the joy that passes all understanding and the peace of God that passeth all understanding because he is in that right relationship with God and is thus receiving the blessings of God. And yes, that blessing, including the aspect of being able to, be su to suffer for the cause of Christ. And so yes, he is blessed. He is receiving something from God that is for his good. But as we looked at the suffering of Christ... We noted that that suffering primarily refers to his death. 
in Philippians, the third chapter and verse 10, Paul would say that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now here he's tying in the sufferings with his death. And he says that I might know the fellowship of his sufferings, his death. And again, flip 1 Peter 4 and verse 1, For as much then as Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. You have Christ's suffering is equivalent to his death. And he says, we are to have the same mind. There in 1 Peter 4 and verse 1. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Suffering to death. That's Christ's sufferings. Now then, we are to have that same mind of suffering unto death. But ours is not a physical death, but a spiritual death. In Romans 6, verse 3 and verse 4, Paul would state, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ, or Jesus Christ, were baptized, now notice this, into his death. There's that suffering unto death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Again, there's that death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Ours is a spiritual death, not a physical death that he's dealing with. Arm yourselves with the same mind of suffering unto death that you put away and die to that old man of sin to live unto Christ. And notice there again in 1 Peter 4 and verse 1. Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. Arm yourselves with the same mind. Now notice the result. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. When we suffer unto death, Ours being a spiritual death now, and being baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins, we have ceased from sin. Really, the, uh, the letter of 1 John deals with this a great deal. You could start at the very beginning and just go through the whole book in reality, but in the first chapter, you have the aspect that here's one who's walking in the light. As he is in the light, he has fellowship with God. Chapter 2, we're to walk as he walked. Chapter 3, we're to purify ourselves even as he is pure. And we're told even that that one who is a Christian is one who has ceased from sin. He cannot sin because he has been born again. He cannot sin. A lot of people say, oh, but wait, we still sin. Well, yes, but he's not dealing with a point action, one time sin. It is a lifestyle of the individual that he's living. You see that again in chapter 1. There in verse, well, you go back to verse 4. Here's the joy that we are to have. What is it? That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we, have, that we have fellowship with God and we, now notice this, walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, that's exactly the same thing as what he says later on in the book, that that individual who is born of God cannot sin. That's the individual. He's walking in the light. If he's walking in darkness, there's your two walks that are set forth. You're either walking in the light or you're walking in darkness. If you're walking in darkness, then you do not have fellowship with God. 
If you're walking in the light, you do have fellowship with God. You're not living in sin. Sin is not a perpetual action. We go back to Romans, the sixth chapter. And you start in verse, well, the latter part of verse 4, really, uh, that here is Christ, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. What is that newness of life? Well, let Paul explain as you continue on in the, ch in the chapter. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. What is it? That's exactly the same thing that Peter says, that individual who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. What is it? He's died to sin. And you continue on, verse 6. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. What is our life now? It's life with Christ. Christ is living in me. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more. Death hath no more dominion over him, for in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin. There's that spiritual death that we have. That's taken place in the act of baptism, verses 3 and verse 4. And in that act of baptism, we die to sin. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. There's the other lifestyle. There's the other walk that John is presenting there in 1 John 1, verses 6 and verse 7. Either walking in darkness or walking in light. You walk in darkness, you say you have fellowship with God, you're a liar. Not living, you're not telling the truth. You don't have fellowship with God if you're walking in darkness. If you're walking in darkness. But if you're walking in the light, you do have fellowship with God. There's the two walks. Now then, Paul is expressing the same thing. You've died unto sin that you can now live unto God. That's in verse 10. Verse 11, he continues on. Likewise, reckon ye also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey the love it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the, from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. There again, the two walks that are presented for us. Either we're yielding our members, our body, as instruments unto sin, of unrighteousness unto sin, or we're yielding ourselves unto God and our members as instruments of righteousness unto God. That's the two walks. There's no other way. You're walking in one or the other way. What then? Shall we sin? Well, again, go back to what Peter says, that that individual who has suffered like Christ hath ceased from sin. What then? Shall we sin? Because we're not under law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield your ser yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. What is that form of doctrine? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4 which is we obey a form of it in the act of baptism as we're baptized into Christ's death, we're buried with him by baptism and death, and raised up from that water grave of baptism to walk in newness of life. What is it? That individual who has obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, you were made, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. And so that individual who suffers unto death, 
It's a spiritual death in the act of baptism and being baptized for the remission of our sins, having that died to that old man of sin in that act of baptism, we're raised to walk in that newness of life, of service and dedication unto God, but walking in the light. What is it? Ceased from sin. Death, that death that we die to that old man of sin, no longer now does sin have dominion over us. Will we commit isolated acts of sin when we're trying to live according to God's will? Well, yes, we will. We all do. But our lifestyle is now one of dedication unto God. We've been made free from sin, and that's the power of sin over us, so that we're now yielding our lives unto God. And our lifestyle is that of living for Christ and not living according to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And then, we must suffer to be glorified. Again, we could go back to what Jesus taught in Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12, that theirs is the kingdom of heaven, he says. Then he says, to rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And he ties us in with the prophets of old. They persecuted the prophets, they're going to persecute you. There's the glorification that comes as a result of suffering. In Romans the 8th chapter, verse 17 and verse 18, if ye, and if children, then heirs, Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. What is it? Here's the suffering that we endure with Christ for being a Christian. The sufferings of this present time, though, they're not worthy to be compared with the glory that we're going to receive that's going to be revealed in us, that glory of heaven. In 1 Peter 4 and verse 13, he again says, Rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with exceeding joy. The exceeding joy of that home with God in heaven. In Revelation, they were going to suffer many things. And Jesus tells uh, the church in Revelation 2 and verse 10, to fear none of those things which you're going to suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. You may be tried. You shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death. But now notice this. I will give thee a crown of life. We're going to receive the crown of life as a result of suffering. See, that suffering makes us better. That's why it's given unto us to suffer. But we could also say that if we never suffer, then we might question as to whether or not we're really living the Christian life if we are true Christians. We mention uh, 1 John 1, verse 5 and verse 7, of God is light, and Him is no darkness at all, that we are to walk in the light as He is in the light. Keeping that in mind, go back to John, the third chapter. And in verse 19 through verse 21, it tells us that this is condemnation. That light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil, now notice this, hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. 
But he that trueth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. Here is Jesus, and as Peter describes his life, he went about doing good. In Acts 10 and verse 38. But the world was steeped in evil. And as a result, and when John, here in John the third chapter says that here's light is coming to the world, he's talking about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Christ came into the world, but what's the case? Men loved darkness rather than light. And so they would not come to the light, but they hated the light. They hated Christ, and they hated that which is good and right. But if that is the case with Christ, and he is the true light, and we are reflecting his light, what it's, is it going to say about us? Doesn't it say exactly the same thing in relationship to darkness and light? That men love darkness rather than the light? And thus they hate the light and those who are reflective of that true light, which is Jesus Christ. That's our society today. If we look at it and we're honest about our society, men love darkness. You don't believe it? Just go out and put on the sign. Shall not inherit or will not inherit the kingdom of God and say homosexuals and see what happens. Oh, y'all remember what happened, don't you? Now, why? Because people love darkness. There's been so much talk about the Supreme Court ruling. And yes, there is, as Tim mentioned, as on the sign, there's a higher court than the Supreme Court and SCOTUS. And every one of those members, those nine members of the Supreme Court are going to stand before that higher court and give a, an account as to what they've done. But have you wondered why those individuals decided to make that ruling to wipe out all of the millions of people in the United States and what they believed and the laws that had been passed in 30 to, I think, about 39 states affirming marriage being between a man and a woman and say, all of that's wrong. They are now wiped off of the books. It doesn't matter what you in the states did and what you voted for. We're going to make it where homosexuals can marry and we're going to call it marriage you can call it whatever you want to it's still not marriage never will be never was why did they do that it's because men love evil and darkness and yes if you ask my opinion as to what's going to take place in this world the church is going to be persecuted. We might not endure going to prison. We might. It's a very real possibility that if we say, for example, in sermons such as this, homosexuality is sinful. It is evil. It is perversion of what is natural that I go to jail. Would not surprise me if that takes place within my lifetime. But right now, that's not going to take place. But we do see very clearly where Christianity as a whole, and talking about Christianity from the world standpoint, is under attack in our nation. And when we uphold the standards, and you know, you got all of these religious groups now saying, oh, homosexuality is all right, we'll perform their marriages, and they can become this and that within our religious group. They can't change God's word about the matter. They just are compromising 
which they've done throughout their existence with God's word. That's all they're doing. But someone who upholds truth and right, what's going to happen to them? Well, they're going to be attacked by those groups that hate the light. And they're going to suffer persecution as a result. Because people's deeds are evil and they love their evil and hate the light. And right now, within our society, because our society has gone away from the principles of Christianity. And I'll say, our nation never was a Christian na nation. The only Christian nation that exists is the church. But our nation, the United States of America, was founded upon Christian principles. And those individuals who established the direct declaration and wrote the Declaration of Independence, who signed it, who set forth those, uh, the Constitution and all of the things relating to it. They recognized God within their lives and they recognized and set forth Christian principles. We've gone away from that within our nation. And evil now has the upper hand within our nation. They will lose out eventually because Christianity will prevail. Christ is the victor. They just don't know the end yet. But during this time, yes, they can and they will make concerted efforts to attack those who are Christian and Christianity. And we might end up where initially we might lose our, for example, our tax exempt status. And then we might lose buildings and property to those who are evil. It's already being done. That those who would stand up against homosexuality, for example, well, if you don't make a cake for them, You've lost your business. Now, it's Christianity that is on the, being attacked, not Muslim world. Watch and see what happens if they go into a Muslim bakery and ask them to fix a cake for them. They won't do it. But they won't be attacked either. They won't have their bakery taken away like Christians will because it is Christians that are being attacked. Christianity that is being attacked. Why? Because the world loves darkness. Let me also state that it does present to us some great opportunities. Because when you take a stand for truth and for right, other people will respect such. And as these other groups compromise, there's going to be some within those groups that are turned off by that compromise and turned away from their compromise and they're looking for something. And here we have God's word, the truth of God's word, and we need to be ready and willing to present it to them. And so it will present opportunities to us in teaching the truth to God, of God's word to people. Persecution, suffering, yes, but Christ suffered. He suffered unto death. And while we must suffer unto death, ours is a spiritual death, even though it might end up being a physical death that we might endure, must endure because we're going to live for Christ. But our realization is that we have joy and we're blessed in being su in suffering for righteousness sake and we have that eternal home with God in heaven we're victorious thus if you're not a Christian this evening or afternoon 
obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Become a Christian. If you've not been living the Christian life, repent and come back into Him. And walk in the light as He is in the light instead of walking in darkness. And if you need to repent and come back into Him, then let us pray with you this afternoon for the forgiveness of your sins that you might live for Him. If you need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.